these articles in the newspaper are really enlightening and and someone I think the community feels very grateful for that li for that librarian and her team of workers who will go across the street to the park and provide what's necessary to resuscitate someone who's overdosed whether it happens in the library or across the street also have people coming out of prisons um, detox hospitals you know, they had something that occurred that, that interrupted their use for a couple of days or longer. And that puts them at risk because they come back and think, I can go back to using this. So the concept of harm reduction and the concept of holding with prevention point is not just telling people, here you go, go ahead and use and you know, and do what you want. It's about trying as best as possible to work with the system for the most part program. When you use a drug. You keep it secret. For reason, somebody who has not used in 24 to 48 hours, if you go 24 to 48 hours without using it, tolerance changes. It is one of the reasons why we have so many overdoses during the holiday seasons. Obviously, using alone, depressed and all that contributes also during the holidays. But people go home for the holidays, they don't want their family to see them injecting or not, and then they'll go get some boxing or something to hold off the withdrawals or the cravings. And then when they come back, they think they can go back to using the same amount they were using a couple days earlier, and they overdose. Now you have, you were talking about fentanyl, so fentanyl you have, there's, fentanyl itself is between 50 to 100 times stronger than heroin. Car fentanyl, which she was talking about, the other one she mentioned, was if you got a chance to see back in August of last year, on Facebook, there was a picture circulating of the grandparents who overdosed in the front seat while the grandbabies were in the back. Yeah. That was carfentanil. That is an elephant anesthesia that's 10,000 times stronger than heroin. In between that, you have roughly about 40 different fentanyls of all different grades. Now, one of the things that happens is if you have, in, in fentanyl, this administered in a, in, a medical, in a medical setting, and usually they take weight and everything into consideration, age, and they have, make sure they measure out an appropriate amount to get to the individual. So make sure they weight back up. That gets processed. That in the process becomes more fentanyl within the system when it's processed and the body processes it. With, with fentanyl, because it's, it, it's not measured out to the person, a lot of times what ends up happening is the lung seizes. And they found that almost 60% of people that had died of fentanyl poisoning didn't have more fentanyl in their system, which means the drug didn't have time to process. That means they literally stopped breathing within the first two to three minutes of having consumed the actual fentanyl itself. Now, one of the things that happens with fentanyl is that when the lung seizes, the person tends to seize as well. Their jaw locks up, and sometimes you'll find people that look like they're having a mini seizure. And you have people go, oh yeah, they're having a seizure. No, 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 they're overdosing. No, but look, and it's because the, mouth, the jaw locks up and they become stiff. That's usually fentanyl. With, oh, with regular opiates, you have somebody who gradually starts to nod out, and they might gradually, their breathing gets less and less, and slow down to where they may stop breathing. But you can tell when they hit the ground and you start to work on them that if you can't open up the mouth and it's cringed, that's usually fentanyl. When it's opiate, when you opiate, you can open the mouth and check and do you know, the rest of the breaths. So find people in one of two situations, on the ground or in a chair. Usually if you're in a facility and you find them in a chair, I always say, we have to respect this individual's face. That person may be and, you know, a user, and they might be abusing drugs, and they might not be living the, the, the perfect lifestyle. Their their area and their who, who they are as a person, we still have to respect that space. You don't just walk up and kick the chair or hey, what's going on? And yeah. Come up and you say hey, are you okay? If you know the person's name, you call their name, hey man, are you okay? If they're not responsive, you may want to do noise. If they don't respond to that, then you do the chair. And if they're not responding to that, then you go physical. Obviously, if they're blue or they look like they're really, you know, compromised, like they're really having a tough time breathing or whatnot, you might want to, which one of the easiest things to do is you grab the person's hand, and if you take your index finger and your thumb, and with the tip of your thumb, your fingernail, you press the center of the fingernail on the index finger, very uncomfortable, very painful. If you press that and they don't respond, that's a clear indication that they're probably not conscious. Um, you have the earlobe that you can pinch between the, the fingernails, you can pinch the earlobe. Or they do a sternum rub, which is you take your knuckles in the center of the chest and you rub. That one is, is commonly used by, by EMTs, paramedics, and you know, the only, 
precaution that I have for that is, if you're male and the person unconscious is a female, I would recommend you use the fingernail and whatnot, because if you put your hand between her breasts and she happens to wake up, you might be the one in pain with that. <laughs> so, or, or have to explain what your hand is doing in your head. So in some cases, you know, you want to do sound first, then you want to do, uh, you know, try to get this person stimulated. If they're not, then you do painful stimuli. If they don't respond to a painful stimuli, there's a good likelihood that this person is, is, is you know, in a bad situation. If they are purple, if you can tell, if the person is the darkest skin of the individual, they get like a silver tint or an ash color. If, that, if you see that, then obviously this person is already in distress. There's no need to be like, are you okay? Because it's, obviously, it's obvious that they're not. Call 911 immediately. Anytime that you have somebody in distress or that somebody's not breathing, you call 911. There is a standing order in place that gives you permission to walk into a pharmacy and buy Narcan with your insurance or cash. No questions asked. There's also a good Samaritan and you know, all this attached to that, which states that when the paramedics come out or the police comes out, it's not, a, it's not to arrest the individual that's overdosing or the person who called, it's to make sure that the person overdosing survives. Historically, it was they would arrest both individuals because the overdose had occurred during the commission of a crime, which was the use of an illicit drug. Now, that, that, that standing order helps the individual calling and helps the individual who's overdosing to make sure they get to the hospital. Obviously, if there's a firearm involved or large amounts of drugs or if the person has a warrant for a serious crime, they're still going to intervene. They're not going to let that person go. But other than that, usually if it's a couple bags or whatever, they have a tendency not to say just, you know, take them to the hospital and, and make sure they survive. So, if you find somebody on the ground and they are not breathing, first thing you need to do is make sure that this person breathes. Remember that you can go 40 days without food, about 10, 13 days without water. You cannot go more than 8 to 10 minutes without oxygen because the brain damage starts to set. So even if you don't have Narcan, the key thing is to get this person breathing. When you get to this situation, you're going to make sure you secure the area. And what I mean by that is look around before you even bend down and start working on this person. Check to make sure that there's no needles in the area. You may see a bag which just gives you an indication of what they may have used. Or they may still have a needle stuck in their neck or their arm, which you have to secure. Remove it, either toss it to the side, give it to somebody. I usually keep a plastic bottle, put it in a plastic bottle, secure it, and then dispose of it later in a, appropriately, then go to work on the person. Call 911, come down and check. You want to make sure the person is laid out flat, you're going to put your head on the forehead, tilt the head back, check the mouth to make sure that there isn't something obstructing the, the, the airway, because they may not be breathing because something is blocking it. A lot of times you have individuals who inject who the minute that it, touch, it hits the bloodstream, they can taste the bitterness of the drug, and they don't like the taste, so prior to using, they may put candy in their mouth to mask that taste. <coughs> you may find easily find somebody overdosing with a mouthful of candy. If that's the case, make sure you put on gloves. You're gonna grab the individual's shoulder and the waist, you're gonna roll them to you. You're gonna clear whatever's in their mouth, you're gonna put them back on their back again. At this point, nine times out of 10, you should have a face shield, if you have the kits, it usually comes with the face shield. You can easily purchase these online. And these are, uh, these are basic, but it has the face printed on there. You cannot mess this up. <laughs> you cannot get this wrong. So it goes over the face, nose with the nose, you pinch the nose, tilt the head back, make sure that the airway is open. Two strong breaths every five seconds. Count them out. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, two strong breaths. Usually you have you know you have to pace yourself. You don't know how long the ambulance is going to take. Um, it could come in five minutes. It could come in a half hour. Again, one of the most important things is to make sure that this person is breathing. So you want to pace yourself, so you, especially if you're by yourself. If you have other people with you, if you're in a setting with other people, then you can say, "I need you to call 911. I need you to go get me a kit. I need you to help me clear out the room." I need you to go outside and wait for the ambulance and bring them straight here so they know exactly where they're coming to when they get here. Um, and then you do two strong breaths every five seconds. If you're going to administer Narcan, if they're not breathing, you can administer the Narcan first. You can do 
Rescue breaths for about 30 seconds, which calculates to about 12 breaths. Then hit over Narcan, continue the rescue breaths. If you get the person breathing with rescue breaths and not having, and you didn't give them Narcan, and they're breathing and you see that their color is coming back, there's not necessarily any need to give them the Narcan right away. Keep an eye on them, put them in a rescue position, make sure that the ambulance is on their way. If you see that they're going back into the stress and they're going to stop breathing, then give them the Narcan, continue to do rescue breaths, put them in a rescue position. And I'll show you how that looks in a minute. You have the most commonly used product is this one. This is what's known as an antagonist. And basically this shares receptors with the opiates and it gradually, you know, starts to fill in receptors and push the opiate out and bring the person, starts to wake them up. Historically in the past, paramedics used to use this. This is 10 cc's of Narcan and if they gave somebody this whole 10 cc's, this is a complete blocker. This is also a reason why people used to overdose because they would get completely blocked after overdosing, they would get this and be completely blocked and go into withdrawal. They thought a lot, of, and if you work with anybody in recovery or anybody who's actively using, they need to know that Narcan does not flush your system out. It just temporarily blocks the receptors for 30 minutes to 90 minutes. What ends up happening is that people thought this flushed them out and they went out looking for more to counter the withdrawal. And when this wears off, then what they had in their system initially that caused the overdose with what they put on top could be a fatal overdose now. Because now they have double or triple the amount that they had in their system originally. So it's important for people to understand that this wears off between 30 minutes to 90 minutes. The Narcan or Naloxone will wear off. And whatever opiate is still in their system, those effects will gradually start to come back. In some cases, if it was methadone related,